Representative First, Number 23, Lids versus Maryland Department of the Environment. Good morning. Good morning. Please support Mason Nelson, my colleague, Phil Hoon, for the uh, petitioner, Gail Litz, uh, in, in this case. Uh, the court, of course, is familiar with the facts. The court summarized the facts in our first uh, trip uh, to this court a year or two ago. And the appeal before the court today concerns my, our clients' claims for inverse condemnation against the state and the town and her trespass, trespass claim against the town. Her negligence claim uh, will go to the uh, uh, jury and is subject to the uh, Maryland Tort Claims Act. It's not an issue uh, before uh, this court today. Uh, with regard to the inverse condemnation claim, uh, this court granted certiorari to, to review the uh, Court of Special Appeals' holding uh, that her inverse condemnation claim is covered by the Maryland Tort Claims Act and the Local Government Tort Claims Act. Uh, my client uh, asserts uh, that these acts should not cover her inverse condemnation claim because they are constitutional taking, uh, not a tort. Now, on this central issue, the town offers no argument on the question of whether my client's claim for inverse condemnation subject to the Local Government Tort Claims Act offers no argument whatsoever. And the state, uh, the state's position has evolved on this important question. In the lower courts, the state did not argue that the <clears throat> Maryland Tort Claims Act covered Ms. Litz's inverse condemnation claim. But today, uh, in its brief before this court, in this version, uh, in this iteration of the case, um, the state uh, puts forth a new argument that the notice provision of the Maryland Tort Claims Act governs uh, the inverse condemnation claim. We assert that uh, the state's position below, our position throughout, is the correct one, which is uh, neither the Maryland Tort Claims Act nor the local government tort claims governs her uh, inverse condemnation claim. And we. Uh, we point to uh, several uh, cases, uh, Judge Wilner's case in College Bowl, in which he distinguished inverse condemnation uh, from a tort claim. We point to Judge Harrell's opinion in Reichs Ford, and, and a footnote to be sure, but where the court uh, uh, explained that the tort claims, but not the inverse condemnation claim, uh, uh, were dismissed for failing to comply with the notice provisions. Uh, <clears throat> I anticipate that the, the state may characterize these decisions as procedural observations and not, not uh, informative on the question of whether uh, inverse condemnation is a constitutional taking or a tort. Uh, we also point to uh, Judge Green's opinions in Rounds and Espina, Espina which also, <clears throat> um, from my reading, everyone I didn't write it, but from my reading, it's an indication that the court sees a distinction between a constitutional taking uh, and a tort. Uh, for all those reasons, we, 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 our fundamental position is that an inverse condemnation claim is a constitutional taking, not a tort, and therefore is subject to neither the Maryland Tort Claims Act nor the um, Local Government Tort Claims Act. As an advocate for Ms. Litz, that's important because it eliminates from the issues below this question of the timing of the notice. It's pure, it makes it purely a statute of limitations uh, question in terms of uh, damages. The state uh, also raises a concern that my client didn't assert a claim for uh, inverse uh, condemnation. Uh, we disagree. Uh, we think we did. We think that uh, if one reads uh, Judge Will Willner's opinion uh, in the College Bowl case, you see two key elements for a cause of action for inverse condemnation. The first is that a an allegation that a governmental defendant took the plaintiff's property uh, without eminent domain without an eminent domain proceeding. And the second is the taking of the plaintiff's property forces that uh, plaintiff to bear a public burden which should be borne uh, by the public. We asserted both of those things. Our, our second and amendment complaint tracked that, those requirements uh, uh, 
precisely. Uh, I suppose the question is, how did the state defendants take Lake Body? Um, well, there are uh, three state defendants. There's the Maryland Department of the Environment. There's the Caroline County Health Department, which is a state agency. And there is then the, the state as a defendant. So those are the three parties. So uh, let me just go one by one, if I may, Judge Green. Uh, the Health Department is an agent of DHMH, Extract 89, agent of the state. Health Department had the responsibility to review the applications for the septic systems and where appropriate issue permits for the septic systems and had a duty to conduct inspections of its inspe uh, septic systems, Extract 88. And the Health Department negligently reviewed the applications, negligently issued permits, and negligently inspected the septic systems, Extract 89. We assert that's the action of the state agency, the health department, that affected uh, the taking. MDE, Maryland Department of Environment, uh, we assert, of course, we're at a motion to dismiss stage, Judge Green, we all know that. Uh, Maryland Department of Environment enforced no part of the consent decree, Extract 92. I think that. Um, Do you cite any cases where <clears throat> inverse condemnation has been found and upheld based on uh, a negligent regulatory action? Well, we looked at that, uh, Judge Atkins, and, and um, you know, I was thinking about the state's argument well, you need an affirmative action by the governmental entity. Whether it be a claim for inverse condemnation, we looked at that question, and, and I started my analysis by looking at this state's case law, and I saw nothing there. I looked pretty closely, and then we went out of the state, and uh, there were cases that uh, tracked the language that the state was employing here, which is you need an affirmative action, and there were also a lot of cases. Uh, that took the contrary view that inadequate action or no action was sufficient. And I reached the judgment that, the, that the, the cases were all over the map and I'd stick with the Maryland law, which I thought answered the question. So my short answer to your question is there are cases out there on both sides of that question across the country. Which ones are on your side? On the question of the affirmative action piece, yeah. uh, I don't have those sites here. I'm sorry. I'd like to not to put them uh, in our in our papers. Uh, uh, perhaps I should have come equipped with those sites. But uh, we just did a national search, and, and there there are cases that require affirmative action. There are cases that don't require affirmative action. There are cases that say no action is an affirmative action. There are cases that say that uh, inadequate action is affirmative action. They're everywhere. And I just thought it was, perhaps it was a tactical error. I should have come with those cases. I didn't. I'm sorry. The, uh, on the question of, of um, the, the, the statement, of whether my client stated a claim for inverse condemnation, I think that this court's first decision in, in Lich's case is informative on the question. I think that, at least to my reading, I didn't write it, but to my reading, uh, it sure looked like the court thought that Ms. Litz had stated a cause of action for uh, inverse combination. It reviewed the elements in College Bowl. It addressed the causation piece. It talked about what a fact finder could conclude. Uh, and I think um, uh, uh, that's a pretty powerful argument that, that my client stated a claim for Cause, uh, cause of action for inverse combination. The uh, th third question really is whether a trespass claim is subject to 
Now, this is only, trespass claim is only against the town. So the question is whether the trespass claim is subject to the uh, local uh, government uh, tort, tort claims act. Of course, the uh, town offered no argument on this point, but um, the court, lower court ruled against us, so uh, we did. And, and I think this case is qu closer than, this issue is closer than the question of whether inverse, inverse combination is subject to uh, Maryland tort claims and local government. I think it's a closer question. Uh, and I think that um, uh, here's our argument on this point. One is that prior to the local uh, adoption of the Local Government Tort Claims Act, there was the, the uh, uh, local government would have no immunity for uh, a trespass claim. That's the Hebron case. That's our argument. Uh, a federal case subsequent to the adoption of uh, the Local Government Tort Claims Act, the Marcus case uh, endorsed that view. Then we have, on the flip side, the Hansen case, Judge Harrell's opinion, uh, which suggests that the Local Government Tort Claims Act is different than the Maryland Tort Claims Act because what it does is it puts into play a requirement for notice for all types of claims. Uh, so that's the, the, the dilemma we're in on the question whether the uh, trespass claim is subject to the Tort Claims Act. Uh, if I were running the world, I would say uh, it's not. And my rationale is that it wasn't, uh, municipalities never had immunity for uh, trespass. The Local Government Tort Claims Act was not designed to change the rules governing immunity or otherwise for local government. Uh, that to subject uh, Ms. Litch's claim for inverse combination uh, to the Local Government Tort Claims Act would not further the purposes of the statute. So for those reasons, uh, I would come down and decide that uh, it's not subject to the Local Government Tort Claims Act. On behalf of uh, Ms. Litz, we uh, request that the court uh, reverse the Court of Special Appeals' opinion that her inverse combination claim is subject to uh, both the acts and reverse the Court of Special Appeals' uh, ruling with respect to the trespass claim being subject to the Local Government Tort Claims Act uh, we asked the court to uh, find affirmatively that my client stated the claim for uh, inverse combination and then remand the case so after six years we can go to trial uh, on behalf of Ms. Bits, uh, uh, Ms. Litz in the uh, Circuit Court for Carolina County. Thank you for uh, the court's time and attention. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Um, Mr. Johnson, we'll hear first from you and then from the Good morning, and may it please the court, uh, Steve Johnson with the Office of the Attorney General for the State Defendants. Um, in this case, the appellant, uh, Gail Litz, seeks to hold the state financially responsible for the contamination of a lake on her property that was caused by polluted runoff from failed private se septic systems in the town of Goldsboro. In order to get a recovery against the state, she alleged a variety of common law tort claims and an inverse condemnation claim. The circuit court dismissed all of those on the grounds that she failed to comply with the Maryland Tort Claims Act, and she only appealed the inverse condemnation claim. And I'm pleased to be back before the court a second time, urging that you affirm the dismissal of the claim, and this time on the grounds that she failed to state a valid claim. Uh, an inverse condemnation claim is essentially a takings claim, and I would submit that it has two essential uh, elements, and, and they are that there was an act by the state that substantially caused an invasion of the property. Uh, Mrs. Litz in her complaint alleges a couple of things that the state did that she says caused the contamination. The first one was the approval by the county health department acting uh, under state authority of the septic systems that were used by the residents. Uh, this is an action that was taken some 50 years ago. The approval of the septic systems uh, without, without more uh, doesn't demonstrate that they caused the contamination. Uh, in fact, septic systems are designed to prevent pollution. So I don't think that the state's mere approval of those septic systems caused it. It was, in fact, the decisions by private individuals on the manner in which and how they used the septic systems, and more importantly, their continued use of the septic systems once they had failed, that is the cause of that pollution. Uh, the second action was that the state didn't do enough to stop the pollution. 
uh, and more particularly that it didn't enforce the 1996 order that it entered into with Goldsboro, uh, ordering Goldsboro to uh, build a, a public sewer system. Um, those are not acts at all. They're rather failures to act. Um, and the failure to act can't give rise to a taking because uh, uh, the state hasn't taken anything if it hasn't done anything. Mr. Johnson, I, yes. um, Mr. Nelson alluded to having done a national search um, on this subject. Did you uh, do something comparable? And uh, if you did, what conclusions well, did you draw from that? I did. In fact, uh, we cited, uh, as did the Court of Special Appeals, a number of federal cases uh, in which the courts say that they, they're aware of no cases in which uh, a, a, a takings claim arises from the lack of action. And, and so this, this principle that you have to take an action, I think, is well settled in the federal courts, and it is illustrated in those cases. And in each of those cases, and I'm talking about Alves, Georgia Power, uh, Nicholson, um, in each of those cases, the injury was caused by an independent third party. Uh, in Nicholson, it was Hurricane Katrina. And in each of those cases, the courts held that the government's failure to prevent that injury by the third party did not give rise to a takings claim. And although this court hasn't expressly ruled that inaction by the government cannot give rise to a takings claim, I think its decisions have recognized the need for affirmative act. Uh, in College Bowl versus Mayor and City Council of Baltimore, the court described the circumstances under which an inverse condemnation claim would arise, uh, and it described them as, as follows. The denial of access, clearly an affirmative act. Regulatory action, an affirmative act. Hanging a credible threat of condemnation, also an affirmative act. Conduct that effectively forces an owner to sell, also an affirmative act. And more relevant to our situation, conduct that causes a physical invasion. Here there's no allegation of conduct. In fact, the allegation is that there was no conduct. And, and we would submit that can't support a takings claim. But even if MDE had pursued uh, enforcement, say it had sought to enforce the, the consent order, I think there's a causation problem, and, and one of the reasons why inaction can't give rise to a takings claim, because uh, ultimately the decision to stop the pollution rested in the hands of Goldsboro with respect to whether or not they would build a, a public sewer system. It turned out that there was an affordability problem with that. But even had MDE pursued enforcement against the individual septic users, ultimately it's the decision of the septic users whether to stop using that. We can, we can put pressure on them, financial penalties and whatnot, but ultimately it's independent parties making decisions that cause the pollution. So you're saying the law is that MDE has no power really to control when a municipality puts adequate sewer facilities in place? No, certainly it does. Uh, under the environmental article, uh, Article 9, Section uh, 222, uh, the, the department has, is given the discretionary authority to order municipalities where there are failing septi septic systems to build the public sewers. Um, but ultimately, it can, all it can do is attempt to enforce those orders, and when there's a, a failure to comply with the order, I presumably it could go to court and, and seek injunctive relief and whatnot. But ultimately, the power of the court only goes so far in terms of uh, penalties. Uh, ultimately, the decision has to be by the town of Goldsboro to build the, the system. So if, if uh, MDE fails to take uh, its full complement of remedies against a municipality, that's just negligence and uh, or, no. or, or let's say it's intentional. They don't do it. Can that well, I mean, the, the, I, I don't believe so. The the state, I think it's it's well settled that the state ha doesn't owe any duty to to mislits or, or to any specific water body. Its its duty under the environmental article is is to the public generally. It's also well settled that the department has the discretion, almost absolute discretion, in determining how it does enforce the law. And, and actually, an interesting point on, on the issue of whether or not the department had discretion uh, in this case, uh, the circuit court already decided the, that question uh, when it dismissed uh, Litz's 
claim for uh, a claim under the Maryland Environmental Standing Act, the circuit court specifically held that there was no such claim because MDE had discretion to enforce that order uh, and Litz did not appeal that decision. Um, if this court were to find that the failure to prevent pollution could give rise to liability, the, the state's uh, liability would be potentially staggering. It cannot, uh, I mean, it's impossible for the state to be able to address all sources of pollution uh, everywhere in the state at all times. It has to make, obviously, choices. Uh, and so uh, what if placing... What nothing? I'm sorry? What if it did, the department did nothing? Well, fortunately, that's not the case here. The, 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 the department actually did seek to enforce, did, did and, and it has come up with a solution. But, uh, I mean, I would submit that the, the uh, doing nothing uh, does not give rise to a takings claim. Potentially, it could give rise to, a, you know, a, a writ of mandamus where, where somebody could order MDE to take an act that's non-discretionary. In this case, the enforcement of the environmental laws is absolutely discretionary. And, and, I, and I don't think that by beginning enforcement, that is by uh, entering into the order with Goldsboro, that it somehow converted this into a private right that Mrs. Litz had. The, the discretion was the same. Um, and I was going to say that, I mean, if the state could be liable under this circumstance, it would essentially be uh, uh, placed in the position of insuring all private property against pollution damage caused by independent third parties. And I would urge the court not to open the door to that liability. And as I was saying before, this is not a case where MDE turned a blind eye to this problem. It, it actually sought to prevent this uh, initially by entering into the consent order, but when it became clear that the town of Goldsboro uh, didn't have the resources with only 80 residents being able to support user fees, it, it just simply could not construct and maintain a sewer system. Uh, the department has been working, and you'll see, you see in the appendix to the state's brief, have been working for 25 years working with uh, local, regional, state, and federal entities to come up with a solution uh, of these failing septic systems. And, and uh, I'm pleased to report that in August, the, uh, they did begin construction on a regional sewer system in the town of Greensboro that, uh, in the first step, will connect Goldsboro to that. I think it would, be a, it would be certainly a radical change in the law if MDE could be liable to Miss Litz because it either didn't solve the problem fast enough or, or it didn't solve the problem in the manner that she would have preferred. So I would urge the court to conclude that uh, Miss Litz did fail to state a claim, a valid claim for inverse condemnation and affirm uh, the lower court's decision on that. Now I'd like to uh, turn briefly to the issue of whether or not the Maryland Tort Claims Act applies to inverse condemnation claims. Uh, the, the state firmly believes, and I will submit to you, that this is not the proper case to answer that question uh, uh, for the simple reason that there is not an, a valid inverse condemnation claim before the court. Uh, really what you have here is a common law tort in the nature of a nuisance, a trespass, or negligence that's nicely dressed up to look like an inverse condemnation claim. She, uh, the, the conduct, the injury that was alleged are the same for all of the uh, tort claims uh, and the inverse condemnation claim. And also the request for $7 million in damage was the same for all the claims. And that's, that's clearly how the circuit court viewed the case and why the circuit court did dismiss it on the grounds that it failed to comply with the Maryland Tort Claims Act. Is it your view that a continuing trespass or a nuisance, continuing nuisance, can never ripen into an inverse condemnation claim? Is that your position? I would say that, it, well, uh, I, I haven't seen the cases that have indicated that. The, uh, the case law talks about how uh, uh, that, the, that the invasion needs to be substantial for it to go from a nuisance claim to an inverse condemnation claim. Um, substantial in the sense that it pollutes the lake? Well, you might have the, the, the injury component of a takings claim might be there, but just, you're still, uh, as I've argued before, you don't have the necessary act by the state or the causation. But, but in terms of the injury to the property, presumably if the, if the ongoing nature of the nuisance continues to worsen and worsen and worsen the amount of impact on the, the property, then uh, conceivably you might. Um, now, if, if the court int does intend to answer the question in, in this case, we, we believe that the, 
that the lower courts actually got the, got the answer right and that you should affirm them. And I'm going to uh, rely on the arguments that, the, that, that we presented in our brief in support of the state's position. And, and, and unless the court has any specific questions about the state's position, I will, I'll conclude my oral arguments and, and cede any remaining time to uh, counsel for Goldsboro. All right. Thank, thank you for your thank attention. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Good morning, Your Honors. Nicole Nesbitt on behalf of the town of Goldsboro. It's a pleasure to see you all. The argument that uh, Petitioner's Council stood up and gave um, just a few moments ago was that the town has made no argument whatsoever as to whether his clients' inverse condemnation claims and trespass claims fall within the Local Government Tort Claims Act. That's not correct. The key point, the key phrase is his client's claims. His client's claims are covered under the Local Government Tort Claims Act because they're not inverse condemnation claims or trespass claims. They are tort claims for damages based on the town's alleged failure to act as a governmental entity to prevent the acts of private citizens over which it does not have legal control. It's been a very long road in this case to try to separate out the legal causes of action from each other especially difficult because the allegations in the complaint are identical from one claim to the next. But I think what we have endeavored to do is try to assert what the legal basis of an inverse condemnation claim is and how it differs from a tort claim act for negligence. The plaintiff, when she drafted the operative complaint here, has said only this. The town of Goldsboro entered into a consent order. The town of Goldsboro has not complied with the terms of the consent order because it has not taken a regulatory action to prevent private landowners from polluting the streams. That is not a takings claim because we have authority in the line of the Casey and Front Royal cases that are in um, the town's brief that say that if you're going to base an inverse condemnation claim on a regulatory act, there must be a final and authoritative decision on the part of that government entity that you're trying to hold liable for an inverse condemnation in order for there to be an inverse condemnation. Simply saying that a government entity has not cured the acts of private parties nor prohibited them in some way because it has not acted is not inverse condemnation. That is not a taking. A taking is when you assert a regulation that causes a, a, a basically a per permitted, where you're actually permitting and prohibiting the use of the plaintiff's use of uh, property. In other words, let me try to say that a little bit more clearly. A regulatory action can give rise to inverse condemnation if the government entity enacts a regulation that causes that taking to occur. On the flip side, or the contrary side of, the, of that argument, the failure to take action is not inverse condemnation because the town is not reaching out and taking the use of that property. The town is not polluting. Its residents have polluted. The difference between that is essential to understanding what this plaintiff's inverse condemnation claim is all about. Because she is not alleging that the town had a um, septic system of its own in use, as some towns do, some municipalities uh, operate their own. Most do, as a matter of fact, operate their own septic systems. And when they fail, and they failed or they are operating in such a way as to destroy the use of property of another, that could be a takings claim. It could be. But we don't have that here because the town doesn't have such a system. It is private landowners who have caused this pollution. And this discretionary inaction of not preventing that from happening doesn't give rise to inverse condemnation, particularly where the town doesn't have the authority to stop those private landowners. That is a state function, not a town function. So clarify just one thing for me. Though. There was a failed system, right? There was no failed system. There were private septic tanks that private that landowners basement. used. So there was no system. They had their own little wells on their properties. And over time, they disintegrated. 
And the continued use of those private septic tanks by those landowners leached into the groundwater and caused pollution down the line. The question is, so what do you do about that? And the plaintiff in the operative complaint said, you know what should have been done? The county health department should have come in and fixed it and enforced <coughs> its authority to make those landowners fix the problem, and it didn't do so. And the state's point on that, and that's a state function, not a town function, because the town doesn't own the county department of health. The law gives the county department of health that authority. The, the plaintiff in this case said they should have exercised the authority and didn't. The state says that was 50 years ago, and we're not talking about that anymore. So it's all sort of a pointing in, in, in numerous directions, but I can tell you that the way this complaint reads, no one is pointing at the town as far as the failing septic tanks. Where the town comes in is that the town went and entered into this consent order to study a better system. Okay, we've got failing private septic tanks. What can we do about that? Can we implement a public sewer system like many towns and municipalities have to make this better so that people aren't using their private failing septic tanks anymore? Let's study that. And they have. And they've studied it for decades and are continuing to come up with ways to pool resources with neighboring towns to try to implement that. But that's a future action, okay? And what the plaintiff is suing on is what happened before the town entered into a consent order way before, years before, the pollution that caused the loss of this plaintiff's enjoyment of her property occurred in the 70s and 80s and was um, told to her in the 90s, way before the town ever had a consent order in place and way before the town could have done anything about it. What so, was the theory for why the town entered into the consent order? What was the town's obligation to they didn't have one. Um, I wish I had a better. I, 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 I can't answer it any other way than to say I believe so, because the town and the town, the town of Goldsboro and the town of Greensboro and two other neighboring towns are all having the same problem, and they and MDE was trying to determine how best to enforce its obligation to put a stop to this ongoing problem. The town of Goldsboro entered into this consent order even though it doesn't have the legal responsibility to regulate the, se the failed septic tanks. It nonetheless had an interest for its own sort of um, ability to, to maintain the town of having a better septic system in place to attract new residents, I don't know what, so that uh, people so that it could permit new building in the property, perhaps, because right now it's not permitting new building on the property because of these failing septic tanks. That, that's within its authority, but governing the septic tanks itself, that's not within the town's authority. It entered into the consent order to study a better way, and um, that, that's ongoing. Did the town of Goldsboro issue the, through its health department, issue the permits Correct. for the septic tanks? That's right. And it has no continuing obligation when those systems fail? It, it, ha it has the authority to regulate failures of the systems and inspect, inspect systems and um, enforce failures of the systems. It does. Under the environmental code, the county health department has the authority to go around and inspect those systems and make sure they're in proper working order. I, I thought Judge Green's question was as to the town. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's... The town has its own health department? No, no, the county health department. And I'm sorry if town, I misunderstood. The town didn't issue the septic permits. No, it was the county health department that did. did and the, the county... The issued building permits on the strength of the health department issuing the septic permits. The town issue, it has the authority to issue building permits. And so that's one way... It did, didn't it? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer. Was it alleged that it issued No, no. That hasn't been alleged here. I see my time is up. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Nesbitt. Ms. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, can you refresh my recollection? What specific factual allegations uh, were advanced by Ms. Litz as to what the town did that was actionable? I have four key points. How about before it entered into the consent? Let's try that. I have several key points. Uh, first, Extract 88, the town had no public sewage system. Extract 93, the town collects 
and channels ground and surface water continuously and discharges those waters in unnatural and harmful quantities, qualities and rates of flow onto the Litz property. That's all. The, 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 the gravamen isn't that there was <coughs> volumes of water being discharged, was it? It was what was in the water. Correct. Those actions were prior to the entry of the uh, consent order. Then extract 90, the town entered into the consent order. I'm, I'm focusing on before the, okay. before the consent order. Before, two points. No public sewer system. Number two, allow the discharge of the uh, pollution into the surface, into the uh, drainage system, which they knew drained to Lake Bonnie. What authority would the, uh, the uh, town have had to prevent <coughs> the uh, stormwater runoff from the properties that had failing septic fields? Of course, we're here on a motion to dismiss. I understand. I'm, I'm focusing on what you allege the town did wrong. We allege the town improper, I'm extract 93, paragraph 36. The town uh, improperly allows the discharge of contaminated ground and surface water onto Litz's property. Uh, the town continuously and artificially collects and channels ground and surf water, surface waters and discharges those waters in unnatural and harmful quantities, qualities, and rates of flow on the Litz property. That's the allegation. All right. uh, Did you say the town improperly allowed the pollution, the pollutants, to flow into the lake? I'm sorry. Used uh, present tense, if that's what the court was asking. Present tense, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Judge Green asked a question of, I think, Mr. Johnson. Well, can there ever, maybe it was Ms. Nesbitt, I've lost track of it, but is there ever a situation where there can be both, a, or whether a trespass claim can ripen into an inverse condemnation claim? A continuous. All right. I say yes. This is, this is how I see it. The, we believe there's both, let's just take trespass and inverse condemnation. We believe they're both causes of action. And then the question is, what distinguishes one cause of action from the other? That a trespass is just when someone's property enters somebody else's property. That's a trespass. Uh, and we have that here, indisputably, the pollution entering the Litz property. The inverse condemnation claim has that plus these two facts. A governmental defendant takes the Litz property without eminent domain. That's not required for a trespass action, the absence of an eminent domain proceeding. And number two, that the taking of the Litz property forces her to bear a public burden which should be borne by the, which should be borne by the public. That's not a requirement in a trespass action. So that's what separates, we assert, the inverse condemnation claim for the trespass claim. So there can be both. What did you allege was wrong about the health department issuing the septic permits? I've got my notes, sir. Extract 88. I'm saying we're in motion to dismiss, no discovery. That's why I said alleged. Right. The health department had the responsibility to review applications for septic systems, where appropriate issue permits for septic systems, and conduct inspections of the septic systems. Extract 88. Then in extract 89, we allege the health department negligently reviewed the applications negligently issued the permits, and negligently inspected the septic system. What was wrong with the permit application? Was the, the percolation test results not within the requirements? Uh, did they fail to find uh, a perched water table that you shouldn't put a drain field in? Mm -hmm. What was wrong with the permit application? Well, if, if, you, if, if you read uh, the, the various, the second amendment complaint, the third amendment complaint, these, this is the picture 
that we assert. You have a small town, elevated groundwater, it's eastern shore, septic systems that are intersecting, in many instances, the groundwater. Not a good thing. Then you have these public drainage areas, these two man-made ditches that were designed to carry surface water flow to uh, downstream, but because they intersected the groundwater, they also carried the contaminated, so you have a septic system submerged in groundwater, no proper drainage system. Groundwater carries that to the public drainage area, uh, and then it leads to Lake Bonnie. Uh, so that's, that's the problem. I, I understand your overview, but is that in the complaint as to why the health department did something wrong here? Just one moment, sir. I was citing earlier the second amended complaint because that was the claim, the, the complaint on which the circuit court dismissed the um, claim against the state. The court asked me to file an amended complaint because I had attached to my papers various papers that laid out the facts I just gave to your honor. So if we go to the third amendment complaint, which is the relevant complaint regarding the town, and that appears at extract 196. And I would direct the court's attention. The answer to your question is yes. And I would ask the court to review extract uh, 199 through, say, 204. And, and the answer is yes. With respect to the question uh, that uh, my adversaries or the issue, the argument they presented, which is, wait a minute, no affirmative act, the act, the lack of affirmative act, I would appoint the court to the College Bowl case, which talks about the conduct of the government leading to the taking. It doesn't say affirmative action, conduct. And I think that this court's uh, jurisprudence in the tort arena about substantial contributing factor causing uh, a, 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 an injury uh, informs the question that we don't need an affirmative action in this case. On behalf of Ms. Litz, uh, she's grateful for the court's continued interest in her case. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Thank you, counsel. Next, the court will hear number.